I am Pastor Roy, and welcome again, and let's pray, and we'll get into our study this evening. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come before you. We're just grateful to be in your presence, Lord. We're grateful for just the work that you're doing in each and every one of our lives, Lord. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit and the work that he does for us. Lord, we're, just, we're grateful we can come to a place. We're grateful we have a, a place with great weather that we can enjoy. And truly, we're thankful that we can come here with other brothers and sisters and just dig in and learn the truths that you have for us, Lord. As we look at the gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we go through this series, Lord, we just, we're grateful on how we can grow closer to you. We can understand who you are and what you want from each and every one of us, Lord. So Lord, we thank you for this time. I pray that you'll be with me, help me to be a vessel, be used by you, and to speak your words and your truth, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Cell phone off. All right. All righty. One last thing. So, We're continuing in our series in the Gospel of Jesus Christ and traveling through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in chronological order. And we're coming through as Jesus has been in his ministry. He's been going through um, different areas. He set up camp. His home base of operations is now in Capernaum, the Galilee area where he's doing a ministry and doing a work as we look into it and see. So I have a question for you guys. Have you guys ever volunteered somewhere? Yes. Yes. Volunteering is great, right? Because you get to go on your own time. You get to be there for as long as you want to. If someone comes up and asks you a question that you don't want to answer, you can pretend like you don't work there. Okay, that's only me. Um, But as you volunteer and you do it over time, they kind of get to know you, right? And then as time comes on, it's not so much that you show up when you want to. You start to show up on more of a regular basis. And now all of a sudden you notice you got a name tag, you got a locker to put your stuff in. And at one point they come to you and go, so have you thought about helping out here on a more consistent basis and making this permanent? And you're like, isn't that what I've already been doing? I mean, I've been here all the time. But it's that official moment when things change. You're no longer that volunteer doing it on the ease. You've now been asked to come on and to be a part of it. And it changes. But for some people, they kind of sit there and go, well, I've always had that spot. What makes it so official? What we're going to be at tonight in looking at the ministry with Jesus, with Jesus and his disciples is we're going to see some official things start to happen. Some things that we kind of already may have assumed, unfortunately, were already in play. We're going to see the fact of it starting to take more of an official position in the life of not just Jesus, but the life of the disciples and the ministry and the work that Jesus is doing with them in the Galilee area. So as we travel through our journey of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the title as we'll be looking at the ministry tonight is It's Official. We're going to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke tonight mainly. But if you want to mark your pages, we'll be in Mark or Matthew chapter 4 first. Then we're going to jump to Mark chapter 1. And then we're going to jump to Luke chapter 4. So if you want to hold your places, Matthew chapter 4, Luke Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4, and we'll go in that order to make life easy for you, okay? I don't want to confuse anybody. So make your way over to Matthew chapter 4. It's the first section that we're going to look tonight, and we're going to kind of see some things that take place. So let's read and just see where we're at here. So picking up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, and we're going to read through verse 22, we read, And Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And verse 20 tells us they immediately left their nets and followed him. Verse 21 says, going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So what we're going to see here that's covered in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Mark and Luke is the band. Really, we're going to see that Jesus is getting the group of guys together. And I know what you're thinking, because we talked about it. Weren't they already with Jesus? Weren't they part of the band already? 
Well, yes and no. And I know what you're thinking. That makes no sense, right? How can you have a yes and a no? I know. But hear me out for a minute. I'm going to say, yes, they were part of the band in the sense they followed Jesus. They had done some stuff with Jesus in the ministry so far. And if we look at it, Andrew, remember Andrew back in John chapter 1? He was hanging out with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist did what? As he's famous for, he pointed people to Jesus. So he points Andrew to Jesus. Andrew goes and meets Jesus. And then what does he go and do? He goes and gets his brother, brings his brother to meet Jesus. So they're kind of already hanging out with Jesus. They're kind of got that unofficial early crew setup going on, right? They're the insiders. There's some other guys that joined in on it. And as we know, um, James and John kind of came in too because they were friends of Andrew and Peter. And you know how it is when you hear the friends got the good things, you want to hang out with them because you want to be on the inside. Everyone wants to be on the in click, right? Okay, just me again. That's fine. But as we see over the time and going through it, they kind of got pushed that way. So yes, they kind of were with Jesus. They may have traveled down to Jerusalem during Passover. They may have been at some certain events, but nothing was official. So that's why there's the no side of the answer. They're not just following Jesus. They're still living their own lives. Where did Jesus find them that day? He found them working with their tools, and the tools of their trade that they were mending to. He found all before, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, tending to the tools of their trade. Just so you know, there wasn't a lot of different work in the area. Historians actually say there was two major jobs you could have in the Galilee area at that time. The first was being the manufacturer and export of millstones, and the second was a fisherman. They say there was roughly probably about 245 to 50 boats on the Sea of Galilee every day, which is saying there's got to be a lot of fish in there or some really bad fishermen. I don't know, but meaning that these guys were not just your average laborers. These guys were businessmen. I mean, James and John worked the family business because they worked for their dad. Peter had his own boat. So these were guys that weren't just struggling to get by in existence, as often portrayed, giving us the idea that they easily walked away from their work and they followed Jesus. When he said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, it wasn't this thing where they're like, well, work's not going that great, so I might as well go do this thing. More than likely, it was a struggle. It was a challenge for them to give up what they knew, what they had as a firm foundation, a solid thing, to sit there and go, okay, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Yes, they left their work, but it's because they already had a knowledge and understanding of who Jesus was, the ministry that he was about, and the things that they saw him do. So when he called them, they were at a place where they were comfortable enough to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't a guy that just does things haphazardly, right? He's pretty strategic in how he looks out and he does things. And in doing so, he was developing a group or a community of disciples. And he was doing it by looking for certain guys. He wasn't looking for the best guys or the most qualified guys, but he wanted the right guys guys, to follow him and to associate with him and to learn from him and take on the title of a disciple. And a disciple is one who both identifies with and learns from his master, all right? Which meant that when Jesus called these guys to respond, they responded not just because it was the cool thing, but they responded out of obedience. And the scripture tells us what? They immediately left their nets, their boats, their father, and they followed Jesus. These four guys would make up the inner circle of Jesus' discipleship group, disciple group, right? We know that there's 12, right? The 12 disciples. The inner circle of that would be these four. We also know that he has 77 disciples that we'll read about later that he sent out to do missions work. There was hundreds of disciples that followed at certain times, but these would be the four inner guys with Jesus. They were average men. They were idealists. They weren't the bravest, they weren't the smartest, but they were hard workers. Think about what Jesus had to work with. He had Peter, who was impulsive and headstrong. Sound like anybody you know? Well, then without that, you got Andrew, his brother, who was 
homespun and supportive and kind of did the behind the scenes of bringing people to Jesus. And then you had James and John, the ambitious group guys, right? They were the ones with the nickname Thuns of Sunder. Oh, wait. Oh, gosh. Sons of Thunder. What the heck? Whatever. I still don't know how I did that one. But though these guys were who they were, each one of them was willing to take a step of faith, to change, and to identify with Christ, become disciples, and become messengers of the kingdom of God. Crazy thought. I like to think crazy sometimes, and it kind of opens up in how we think and what we see. But Jesus called these guys to be disciples which was not a common approach for the time and era that Jesus lived in. Typically, if a teacher or a rabbi was to get a group of people, they would wait for them to start following along them and kind of claim them, kind of like how a puppy dog will take claim of you. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus picked these guys, and he was strategic, and he said, hey, come here and learn what I have to show you. Jesus was discipling these guys by being with them, modeling his truth rather than simply teaching them the law and how to admonish the law. Another crazy thing with that is Jesus didn't do what the rabbis typically did either in the sense of when a rabbi got a student that followed underneath them, they would train the student and encourage them and go through a thing and get to a point where they would graduate the student to become a rabbi. Not the case with Jesus. Jesus was looking for disciples who would remain disciples that would get other disciples and in turn keep the cycle going. They didn't reach a place of achievement. They continued the work of being a disciple, which is why he called them to be fishers of men because they were to invite others to come along the journey, to be fellow disciples in the kingdom of God, not to teach and admonish the law, but how to live for Christ. Jesus had a method for teaching his disciples, a method that was not the norm, was not the thing that everyone else did, but he did it in a way where he lived and did life with each and every one of his disciples. So what we're going to see now is we're going to move into and kind of check out a day in the life of Jesus with his disciples. And what we're going to do is we can find this in the Synoptic Gospels. Remember Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We can look at it. We're going to turn specifically to Mark chapter 1 if you want to make your way over there now. And we're going to look at the work. And we're going to look at a few things that took place in this day. So we're going to start by reading verses 21 through 31. No, we're going to stop at verse 28. Yep, 21 through 28 of chapter 1 of Mark. And we're going to see here some stuff going on. It says that they were, went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. We knew that was tradition for him, right? If it's the Sabbath, where could you find Jesus? In the synagogue. So he's in the synagogue. Verse 22 tells us, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe's. Now, oh, it's going to get interesting. There was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What, do we, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then all were amazed, so they questioned him among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. What we see here first in in the work and kind of the day of Jesus with the disciples is Jesus' authority here. Mark doesn't clue us in on to what Jesus taught. But what he does show us is Jesus' authority and the authority that he has. His teaching must have been so thought-provoking, so deep, that it actually provoked the unclean spirit to cry out, 
let us alone. So whatever Jesus taught got the attention of this unclean spirit. And we know Jesus, right? Jesus is light. So when he's in a dark place, things are going to get noticed. We know that he was at a gospel that he's preached. He preached repentance and the kingdom was coming. So he preached the gospel to them. It opened their eyes to things and it got the attention of the spirit or demon in this way that he cried out, leave us alone. But then notice the question that he asked. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? You see, the demons, they know who Jesus is. Which means if you claim that you know who Jesus is, just know that you're on the same level as that, okay? And we'll leave that alone. But notice this even too. The demons understood Jesus' authority. And they could see the power that he had, knowing that he could truly destroy them. And this cries out with an expression of dread. It wanted Jesus to disappear, but yet he wasn't willing to hide at the same point in time. And he knew that Jesus could destroy him. So he has a dramatic cry, but then he says something that's a little weird right there, right at the end of that. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Rather than this unclean spirit just being submissive and quiet and being reserved and hiding, The authority that Jesus spoke with, the things that he had to say, caused this spirit to come out and to voice this. And it wanted him to get mad. But at the same point in time, have you ever heard it when someone says, when you're having a bad day or Satan's coming at you, like I rebuke you in the name of Satan? Oh wait, no, that's not the right way to say it. Man, I did it again. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. That's the right way. Let's do it again. No, it's... You're having a bad day, Satan's coming at you, and you rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus, right? You have that power over Satan. So now you've got this unclean spirit trying to do what? Have power over Jesus. I don't know how smart he was. But he thought in an ill-valid attempt that he had enough power to put Jesus into his place and to have triumph over Jesus. He had ill-form attempt to control Christ. And at that moment, this is probably one of those moments in the synagogue where everyone's sitting there going, what's going on? Oh my gosh. This is the moments where if it would be nowadays, there'd be something going out and we'd all be like this. So I'm live at, and oh my gosh, no one knew what to do. The spirits come in at Jesus and doing, and what does Jesus do? Because he's Jesus. Thank goodness. He has the calm, the thing. He just simply says to the spirit, be quiet and come out of him. Now, I'm not 100% on this, and I find it interesting, and I really did try to go look at the real language, because a lot of people say this is like the G version of what was said, and they tend to say, the scholars and things, that Jesus said, shut up, as a more demanding kind of thing. I don't know if that's true, but it's Jesus, He doesn't have to use the harsh language at the same point in time. He's direct enough in just saying, be quiet and come out of him. And rather than the spirit doing anything crazy, Jesus doesn't do any fancy tricks here still. He simply delivers the words to the spirit. And it's in that moment that the man that's afflicted by the unclean spirit is thrown to the ground as if the spirit knew that he was no match for Jesus, but he wasn't going out without a fight. So he throws the guy on the ground, shakes him up, and then comes out of him and leaves. At that moment, everyone's like, whoa, who is this guy? And they start to talk, and they start to speak. And we see here that what Jesus had to say truly was profound. It was the gospel, and it shows that the gospel is for all. Even the worst, the gospel is for And the intent of the gospel is to change the lives of those who hear and believe it to be truth. Which is a good thing. Because we as the church, the body of Christ by definition, we are those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. Which means that we live and speak God's word. And we are doing the ministry of of him and his authority, as the scripture tells us, we're trying to tell those about what? The kingdom of God. We know that when we do this, that Jesus is with us. 
His authority rests with his church. Now, do some abuse that authority? Yes. Do some say that different things can happen to different people? And if we've had it, and I've had questions before. People ask me, can I be possessed by a demon? And I look at him and go, is Jesus in you? Well, I think so. Well, you can't think. You've got to know, right? And we know from what Scripture tells us in Colossians chapter 3 that if the Spirit is in us, we cannot be possessed by anything else. There is no room for that because why? Jesus is light. There can be no darkness. So when someone says they think they could be possessed, that's just your two-year-old freaking out, okay? You can't be possessed if you're in Christ, as we see here, because we are filled with him. And in a moment like this, it freaks out the church. They see everything go down, but they're amazed, and the people understand what Jesus is capable of was just simply his words, the authority that he speaks with. Well, Mark tells us that word starts to spread, things start to happen, and church is over now. So what's the best thing that you can do after church? Go home. So let's see what happens here. We're going to pick up in verse 29 of chapter 1. So it says, now they came out of the synagogue. They entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him, being Jesus, about her at once. So he came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Wow. So we've seen Jesus' authority. Now we see Jesus' heart as he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Can you just see it? Church is over. Pretty amazing things happening. Let's go home and have lunch. You show up and the cook is sick. Now, I'm not going to say that Peter knew or didn't know this was going on. You know how most guys are. They don't pay attention. But he brought everybody home with the hopes of having supper, and it's not going to happen because mother-in-law is sick. And they say something to Jesus, and we see there that Jesus heals her. And I want to look at the way that Jesus heals her. And this is looking at all three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Luke's account, it says that Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever in Luke chapter 4, verse 39. In Matthew's account of Matthew chapter 8, verse 15, it says Jesus touched her. But here in Mark's account, we read what? He took her by the hand. If we take all three accounts and put them into one picture We see that Christ was standing close to her bed. He taking her by the hand, he rebuked the fever and gently raising her up before Peter and all those that were in the room that day. The point is this. Jesus could have healed her any way that he wanted to. He has the power. He has the authority to do it. But truly, what did he do? He extended the hand And with a simple expression of gesture, of love, and desire, he tenderly met this woman's needs, relieving her of the fever. And then there's that, but now there's her response. And her response truly shows her heart and her desire that she immediately got up and did what? She began to serve them. So guess what they got? Dinner. Yes! To be honest with you, This is a telltale sign of anyone who has truly received Christ in their life. The response is not just to go about life, but to serve God, to praise him for what he's done. There's a story of a woman that talks about how Christ changed her life so much that she said, Christ has changed my life, and he shall never hear the end of it. Constantly praising God for what he did, telling people, look at what God did for me. That is the response of one who has been healed by the Savior. With all this going on in Capernaum, you got the synagogue news, you got the news of Peter's mother-in-law being healed. Sabbath is coming to a close. Just so we remember, right? When does the new day start for the Jews in this time? In the evening at six o'clock, right? So guess what everyone else is doing at home right now? They're getting their sick. They're getting their demon-possessed two-year-old. They're getting all this stuff together, because why? They're going to go find Jesus as soon as the sun goes down. And they're going to bring all that to Jesus because why? They want to see him get, they want to see a healing take place. So let's just see what happens. 
Picking up in verse 33 of Mark chapter 1, it says, At evening when the sun had set, they brought all to him who were sick, those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Man, sorry for Peter's address getting out there, right? Then he, he, it says, Then he, being Jesus, healed many who were sick with various disease, cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Truly we see Jesus' heart and his response to heal the people that came to the door that night, to heal the ones that were sick, to heal the ones that were demon-possessed. He did all of it because he had a heart for the people. And what a wonderful evening it must have been. The demons fled their presence of the people. The bedridden were tossing their mattresses and crutches into the air. They were walking home. The comatose were now lucid and talkative. Onlookers were in a state of joy, taking in just what they're seeing take place before them. As marvel as it was, we have to be careful here to not be too naive about what was really going on. You see, most of the people, pretty much all of them, came simply wanting to see Jesus and to get something from him. They wanted a physical healing. They wanted the instant gratification Can we blame them? No. But at the same point in time, sadly, those that came that night tragically foreshadow the millions of people across the centuries who have come to Christ only with the hopes to receive the physical healing and missing the spiritual healing of what God had for their souls. And unfortunately, they only saw the temporal fix and they missed what Jesus truly had to offer them that night. It was an amazing night, but there's the next morning. And just as the night is needed, we see that the morning brought a time where Jesus needed, in a sense, to find focus. So he slips off, the scripture tells us. So we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to see about the next morning and the focus here. So in Luke chapter 4, picking up in verse 42, we read, Now when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of the God, of God, kingdom of God to the other cities also. Because of this purpose, I have been sent. We're going to stop right there. And in an attempt, we see here that Jesus has a great night. Everything is good. Luke really does kind of transition quickly from dusk to dawn. We don't know why Jesus went away. We don't know, understand. It doesn't tell us the purpose of his separation from the people. But we can think of in a few things, right? We'll make some assumptions safely. Maybe it was just the fact that he got overpeopled and needed to get away from them. That happens sometimes to us, right? Maybe it was the fact that he just needed to get back to God and praise God for what he was doing. Maybe even it was just the fact that he needed to understand and pray and ponder why was it that they were so in love with the gifts of God, but not God himself. We don't know, but we know this. What happens when you get by yourself when you get praying? Interruptions come, right? Or is that just me too? All right. Interruptions come. And the people, of course, you can only hide for so long. They find him. They start to interrupt him. And doing so, Mark tells us in his gospel that Peter and the guys found him first. And you know what they say then? They say to Jesus, we searched for you. They found him and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. So, We found you because they want you. Kind of silly situation, right? Really, they wanted to know where he was too. But the thing we see next is Jesus' response to the people. His response to the people when they found him that morning was truly a a saddened response to some, a humbling response to others, and probably to the majority of them, it was a shocking response. Because suddenly they realized the words that Jesus spoke to them let them know that Jesus not only concerned for them, but concerned for more people. He wasn't their personal healer. 
He had come with a greater purpose to do the Father's work and to build the Father's kingdom. We end this section of scripture and the three synoptic gospels tell us that Jesus felt an urgent need to go and preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also in the Galilee area. We come to the close of this day. We come to the close where it looks to be an official. We have the group of disciples. We can see clearly the work that Jesus is doing and the focus that he is staying on. So the question that we come to are, so what? What are we going to walk away with? How are we going to apply this to our life? And this is a, it's a challenging question because it hits not just the early onset, but how we go in our response with Jesus. And the question is this. What is your response to Jesus' call on your life? Understand this. Jesus calls each and every one of us. He calls us openly. He calls us publicly, meaning, guess what? We have to respond to the call. And the response to the call is done in the same way, openly and publicly. Yes, some respond fast, Some need more time to think it all out and to take the evidence and understand if it's going to be the best thing for them. Some simply feel that they can wait and make a call when they need to, even if it means never doing that. You've heard the phrase, no action is action, no decision is a decision. We can't wait. Today we saw different ways that Jesus reached out to different groups of people. The four fishermen were what? Busy at work. The unclean spirit and those in the synagogue were worshiping. Peter's mother-in-law, sick in bed. And people came needing to be healed and being brought to Jesus. Not only do we see these groups, we also see the response of these groups. The fishermen immediately followed. The unclean spirit left. Those in the synagogue They were amazed and talked about it. Peter's mother-in-law, she served. The people needed healing, truly wanted more healing. Jesus reaches out to each and every one of us to follow him, and we each have to make a choice. And the choice is up to each and every one of us on how we respond to the kingdom of God. The question is, will we stop what we're doing and follow him, becoming a discipler who will disciple others for the kingdom of God? Or will we simply just wonder and talk about how great Jesus is and consider the things that he does missing what he's truly doing for us, saving souls over physical needs like the people in Capernaum? Remember, the gospel is the power of God for everyone who believes. Jesus' call gives us a call. We must respond. His message, as we find here in the gospel and still today, is the same. Repent of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning that there is an urgency for our response. Not a delay, but an urgency. The steps are simple. And clear, repent, follow, act in faith. So with that, as we think about the response that Jesus has on our lives, the calling that he has placed for each and every one of us, which is different, and that's a great thing, and how he goes about it, I want to ask you a few personal, perhaps maybe even penetrating questions. So some questions about your response. And the first one is this. Is Jesus Lord? If so, is he Lord over all your life so much that in his presence you recognize the spiritual difference in existence between you and him? Simply meaning, is he holy and you are not? The second question in light of this is, did you repent of your sins? And the more than understanding and embracing repentance, as we see, did you truly repent and follow and make a change to go where Jesus would have you to go. Leading to the third question, who or what is first in your life? The fish, the nets, the boat, the career, the income, the brothers, the father, the family. Are we willing to break 
the loyalties, the occupation, the friends, the family, the religion, whatever it is, in order to wholeheartedly follow one master. And lastly, are you willing to do what Jesus says? Are you willing to go where he wants you to go? Are you willing to trust and step out in faith that he is leading you on the path that he has for you? Know this and understand, we're not all going to be leaving the fishing industry, the profession to be called disciples. We're not all going to be martyred for our faith, but he is going to use each and every one of us for the kingdom of God. And what we do know is that Christ calls us to repent and to follow him in faith. And in that journey, we better expect to be disturbed from our ordinary life and accept the changes to know that truly we can show the world we are a disciple of him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for each of my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself as well, Lord, that as we step out in faith, to follow what you would have for us, that you would guide each and every one of us this week and give us the encouragement, give us the strength to know that we are trusting in you and acting in faith as we share the message to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we bring others along in this journey for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.